Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. I am Professor Philippe Girard. In this section, we've studied the Middle Ages, a period that began with the downfall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD. Downfall of the Western Roman Empire, I should say, because the Eastern part survived until 1453 AD. It was known as the Byzantine Empire, and it is our topic for today. The Byzantine Empire was named after its capital, Byzantium, which would correspond to Istanbul in Turkey today. Yet another name for that city was Constantinople. In this class, we've studied the word polis, which means the city in Greek, and Constantine, that first Roman emperor who converted to Christianity. So you may have guessed by now that Constantinople, that means the city of Constantine. And you'd be right. Emperor Constantine, he was the one who moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople in the year 380. This date, 380 AD, effectively marks the beginning of the Byzantine Empire. Creating an empire was not Constantine's goal, though he still saw himself as a Roman emperor. But over the next century, as pressures on the Roman border grew, later emperors split the Roman Empire into two parts, one in the west governed from Rome, and one in the east governed from Constantinople, and what was supposed to be a temporary expedient to respond to threats from barbarian invaders became permanent uh, when the western part empire collapsed for good in 476 AD and only the eastern part survived as the Byzantine Empire. Amazingly, the eastern remnant survived for 1,000 years. So our first question for today is what made the Byzantines more militarily successful than their Roman counterparts? Well, for one thing, the city of Constantinople itself. It was located in a strategic spot alongside the straits that divide Greece from Turkey and Europe from Asia. The city was on a peninsula, so it could easily be defending by sea as long as the Byzantines had a strong navy, which they did. On the landward side, the Byzantines built massive walls that protected the city from invasion. Those walls were only breached twice in their thousand year history. Like their counterparts in Western Europe, the Knights, the Byzantines also employed heavily armored cavalry, what they called cataphracts. By combining speed and firepower, they played the role of a tank on a modern battlefield. This gave Byzantines an edge when facing armed armies, which typically employed lighter cavalry in combat. Other tactics were more unique to the Byzantines, actually both tactics and strategy, which are two different things. Tactics, that refers to techniques used on the battlefield, whether you use an attack on the right flank of your enemy or on the left flank, for example. Strategy, that's the big picture, whether you win a war by relying on an economic blockade instead of a frontal assault, for example. Well, the Byzantines were very good strategists, which should come as no surprise because the word itself that comes from Greek. They knew how to enroll allies and to betray them when needed. And they could do so because they had plenty of silver uh, to buy off uh, allies and enemies. Their currency, the Byzant, it was called, that was effectively the common currency of Europe for centuries, just like the euro or the US dollar today. Money also allowed the Byzantines, who drew from the relatively small Greek population, to hire mercenaries to increase the size of their army. We saw last time how the emperors employed Vikings and Eastern Europeans as part of their personal guard, the Varangian guard. Well, we'll see later on that they also tried to recruit European knights in the lead up to the First Crusade. Most impressively, their scientists developed a chemical product known as Greek fire. Its exact composition was a closely guarded state secret, like the nuclear bomb today. So we're still not sure what it was made of, possibly naphtha and quicklime. What's for sure is that Greek fire was extremely flammable, so when the city was under siege by a superior force and everything seemed lost, the Byzantines would lob hand grenades, all uh, made with Greek fire, at enemy siege engines or ships and then set them on fire. Not even water could extinguish Greek fire. The Byzantines also devised a pump system to spew out the mixture uh, at a distance using a bronze tube like a flamethrower today very advanced for the time. These various tactics and strategies allowed the Byzantines to limp along for almost 1,000 years after Rome fell, 
and in some cases do better than Le Poulenc. In the 6th century, under the rule of Emperor Justinian the Great, the Byzantines retook Italy from the Ostrogoths, North Africa from the Vandals, and parts of Spain from the Visigoths, i.e. they almost brought back the entirety of the Roman Empire under a single rule. Justinian was an interesting figure. He was of fairly humble origin, compared with members of the ancient Roman nobility, and the same was true of his wife Theodora, who was the daughter of an actress, apparently. One critic even claimed that she herself had been going through a disreputable use. Supposedly, she would do nude performances where birds ate grain off her growing area. Well, whether that was true or not, she sure gained her husband's love, who insisted that she be crowned as co-empress, not just as a consort. So the achievements of Justinian's reign uh, should really be described as the achievements of the imperial couple. For example, Justinian was famous for codifying Roman law in a systematic fashion. But Theodora, she participated in the process and she insisted on adding provisions to fight against the sex slave trade, for example. I have a show on Theodora and a women's history playlist on this channel. Just check it out if you want to learn more about her. Byzantines, they did more than just fight and survive. They were the heirs to Greek culture and they spent much time fighting intellectual wars as well. The most important of these debates centered on Christianity, specifically the exact nature of Christ. Was Jesus a god, like his father, or was he more of a regular human being, like the rest of us? When we studied early Christianity, we saw that followers of the prophet Arius believed that Jesus was human, until Arianism was declared a heresy in 325 AD, when Constantine called up the Council of Nicaea, which imposed the concept of the Holy Trinity instead. The Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit were one and the same. That became official Catholic orthodoxy until the present day. Well, Arianism never completely disappeared in the Byzantine Empire, where Christianity split into a myriad subgroups defined by their views on the exact nature of Jesus. Here are some of these subgroups. And don't worry, you don't have to memorize them all. It's pretty complicated terms. Some Byzantines were homo -husiosians. They saw that Jesus and God were 100% identical, not a shred of difference. So the official Orthodox view of the Council of Nicaea. Other Byzantines were homo -husiosians. They saw that Jesus and God were alike in substance, which was very close to Orthodoxy, but far enough that they were seen as heretics anyway. Then there were the homo -ians. They saw that Jesus and God were similar. Think of them as moderate Arians. And then uh, there were the anomo -ians. The prefix A is a negative in Greek, so they saw that Jesus and God were of a distinct nature. In other words, hardcore Arians. This might look like splitting hairs, but the Byzantines were fond of these subtle theological disputes. Emperors were known to weigh in on obscure theological matters and to write treatises on the matter. Some emperors even joined monasteries when they retired or when they were imposed. Religious divisions, they split Byzantine society apart and even imperial couples. Emperor Justinian was a Chalcedon, while Theodora, his wife, she was a Monophysite. Again, two groups that disagreed on the divinity of Jesus. Though apparently they managed to make the marriage work anyway. Other Byzantines, they were not so tolerant, which led to endless upheavals. During the reign of Justinian, lower class people tended to be monophysites, whereas the upper crust stuck to orthodoxy, so you had kind of a double divine, not just religious, but class-based as well. Actually a triple divine because it involved sports as well. The big spectator sport in Byzantium, uh, that was chariot races. Lower class Byzantines were supporters of the green team of charioteers, while well, upper class people were all about the blue team. Soccer occasionally works like that today in cities like Manchester, where there are two soccer teams. It's common for one team to be considered the working man's team, while the other is more like the posh team. Those religious, class, and sports rivalries exploded into an outright revolt against Emperor Justinian in 532 AD. That's called the Nika Revolt, N-I-K-A. And it almost ended Justinian's reign. All seemed lost at some point, but Theodora courageously refused to leave the city, and with her help, Justinian overcame the revolt. Then Theodora, who was a pretty tough cookie, she sent the leaders of the revolt to the Hippodromes, 
and had them all slaughtered. Damsel in distress, she was not. In the end, the Christian culture of the Byzantine world was so distinct that it led to a permanent rift between Byzantine Christians, who were known as Christian Orthodox, and the Catholics of Western Europe. We covered this great schism, capital G, capital S, in an earlier section. Uh, the two sides disagreed over the cult of icons, for example. This meant that the Byzantine church developed its own hierarchy led by a patriarch, a kind of Eastern Pope, who was second only to the Byzantine emperor, while Catholics answered to the Pope in Rome. A country's religion is about more than just religion. It involves literature and the arts as well. The Byzantines were uniquely positioned to build upon what they had inherited from the ancient Greeks, what's called Hellenistic culture. Hellenes, with two L's, being another term for Greeks. The Byzantines, they occasionally used Latin for official business, but overall they were Greek-speaking people. They single-handedly re rescued philosophy. The ancient works of Plato and Aristotle were in danger of disappearing when the Roman Empire collapsed because there was no one left to protect the books and handwrite new copies. The Byzantines were the ones who safeguarded those precious works when everyone else had forgotten about them and then eventually reintroduced them into the Arab world and from there into Western Europe and ultimately to us. Not surprisingly, the art of the Byzantines was very religious in nature. Paintings grew on religious themes, the famous icons. Uh, Byzantine architects, they also built countless churches and monasteries. The most famous of these was the Church of the Holy Wisdom in Byzantium, aka Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom in Greek. The main church of Byzantium had been destroyed during the Nica riots, so it fell to Justinian and Theodora to rebuild it, uh, which they did in grand style. With a diameter of 31 meters, the dome of Hagia Sophia was the second largest example of a Roman arch in the world after the Pantheon in Rome. Contemporaries wondered how it was possible for such a large dome to stay up in the air rather than collapse under its own weight. The official answer was, it was held up by God. Well, almost. The dome was dedicated in 536 AD by Justinian, then it collapsed in 558 and had to be rebuilt, and it collapsed again in 563, in 989, and in 1346, which is a useful guide to know when God went on vacation. Leaving God's will aside, let's look at the physics of the Hagia Sophia and how it stayed up in the air most of the time. The main purpose of architecture, to oversimplify a little, is to create a vast internal space, uh, which means a roof or dome with a very, very long span. And gravity, that's a big obstacle. If you put a stone up in the air to create a roof, it won't just stay there. It will fall straight down on your head which is why a lot of buildings in history were fairly small. Uh, the Mayans of Central America, who are otherwise pretty good builders, they simply stacked up overhanging blocks of stone to create a roof. Uh, but that technique only allowed them to create tiny rooms at the top of their pyramids. Any wider, and the central stones would collapse. Either that, or you could cheat and use wooden beams instead of stone for the roof. That's what the Greeks did for the famous Parthenon. And to the Romans, who were great engineers, they made a major step forward when they invented the Roman arch. Uh, they installed a temporary mold of wood and used it to stack the half circle of stones. By the time the last stone at the top, the keystone, was installed, you could remove the scaffolding and ta-da! The weight at the center would be magically redistributed to the next stone and then the next until the vector reached the walls to the side and then downward into the ground. This opened the way for much larger internal spaces, like the Parthenon in Rome, or elegant bridges, like the Pont du Gard in France. But this technique can only be pushed so far. Ultimately, as the arches grow wider, the weight of the arch is so great that it pushes the side walls outwards and the whole structure collapses, which is why you see so many chapels on the side of the Hagia Sophia. Their role is to buttress the massive walls to prevent their collapse. Even today, engineers are closely monitoring the walls of Hagia Sophia, which still have a tendency to buckle outwards. I remember watching a PBS Nova special about that once. That church was converted into a mosque when the Ottomans finally conquered Byzantium in 1453 AD, which is why you see some minarets around the church today. They're not original. 
And then the Ataturk, the secular president who ruled Turkey after World War I, he turned uh, the mosque into a museum in the 1930s. But the current president of Turkey, Erdogan, is a more militant Muslim who's decided to consecrate it again as a mosque. So we'll see what the future holds. Anyway, the Hagia Sophia has seen a lot of history. Whether it's a church or a mosque, it should still be there long after we're gone as a testament to the magnificent reign of Justinian and Theodora, as long as God doesn't go on vacation again. Time to move on to less glorious topics and cover the decline of the Justinian Empire and then the whole Byzantine Empire. The end of the reign of Justinian was kind of somber. To begin with, uh, he lost his beloved wife, Theodora, who had done much to co-rule the empire. Then the sky turned a weird color, sunlight dimmed, and worldwide temperatures declined, leading to crop failures and famine. Contemporaries looked at this as a kind of divine omen, but most likely some huge volcanic eruption somewhere in the world had released a lot of volcanic dust, impacting the climate worldwide. This had happened at other times in history. As if this were not enough, an epidemic of the plague hit Europe, the Justinian plague. It was similar to the more famous Black Death that hit Europe in the 14th century. We'll study it later on. And then, to top that off, a major earthquake in the Eastern Mediterranean triggered a tsunami in the Byzantine Empire. So with its population in free fall, the Byzantine Empire lost ground militarily, and they had to give up Italy and North Africa. That raises an interesting question. What is the main engine of change in history? Human beings? Great rulers like Justinian and Theodore? Or natural forces like climate and disease? Historians tend to focus on human agency because there is something reassuring about thinking that we can shape our future and that one individual can make a difference. But there are plenty of examples from the, the Black Death epidemic of the 14th century to the Columbian exchange of the 16th century when disease shaped world history, not people. We may even experience that firsthand if global warming gets as bad as scientists say it will, unless we human beings do our part to avoid messing up the climate in the first place and avoid future hurricanes. Back to the Byzantines. Epidemics and volcanic eruptions aside, they were an empire built by military might, and they were destroyed by superior military might. The Arabs were one such potent rival. We saw last time how, in the 700s, they conquered vast tracts of the Middle East that had once been part of the Byzantine Empire, like Egypt. Then in the 11th century, another Muslim group burst into the scene, the Turks, who came from Central Asia. In 1071, they defeated the Byzantines at the Battle of Mansikert and took over Anatolia, which is to say Turkey today. And that created long-term staffing issues for the Byzantines, who recruited their infantry and cavalry from that very region. Also, the Turks were now uncomfortably close to the capital of Byzantium. To alleviate the pressure, the Byzantine emperor called on European knights for help. We'll see that when we cover the Crusades later on. That helped push back the Muslims in the short term, but inviting European knights into their empire was a rare strategic blunder for the Byzantines. Some of these knights during the Fourth Crusade decided to skip Jerusalem altogether and attack Byzantium, which they sacked in 1204. If you ever notice the beautiful bronze horses in front of St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, they came from Byzantium. They were part of the loot of the Fourth Crusade. The Byzantine Empire never really recovered after that. It limped along for a couple more centuries, but by that point the label of empire uh, sounded like a cruel joke, because that empire consisted of the city of Byzantium and little else. The city itself fell in 1453, when the advent of gunpowder made its stone walls obsolete. The Ottomans at that point breached the walls and took over the town, which has remained the main town of Turkey ever since, under the name of Istanbul. So what should we remember of the Byzantines? Uh, first, the fact that they were able to survive for almost a thousand years after the fall of the Western Empire. Second, their important contributions to the field of theology, philosophy, and the arts. Third, the magnificent architecture that they've left us, such as the Hagia Sophia Church. And finally, in the endless list of emperors and empresses of a millennium of imperial rule, one great power couple stands out, Justinian and Theodora. Well, that's it for today. Goodbye. Au revoir.